Hello and welcome to State View. I'm Mark Crosby. Thank you for joining us. State View is a program that looks at, uh, well, legislation that uh, is happening on Beacon Hill and uh, helps relate that to you living in uh, Massachusetts in uh, various districts. I, I say various districts because we do have the Norfolk and Plymouth district, um, I suppose, uh, we do have a focus on that district today with Senator John Keenan. So, Senator, welcome back. Great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure. Uh, these programs certainly benefit um, your district. But beyond that, I, there's often programs like this because it's Massachusetts legislation is really of interest to folks living in Massachusetts. Yeah, uh, so much we deal with uh, beyond uh, local priorities, which are, are, are main focus. Um, we, we do focus on a lot of statewide issues. We, we're a state senate. Um, we are a state legislature, so um, there are a lot of big issues that, that we focus on, and uh, there's been an awful lot going on. Absolutely. And as I look over my topics, uh, there's a lot to get to. So I'd like to start with the MBTA. There's been deaths, derailments, runaway trains, and I believe a colleague of yours is even proposal is even pro is even proposing a federal takeover yes so the uh, house chair of the joint committee on transportation chair strauss has talked about putting the mbta into receivership and the other thing that he has mentioned is perhaps rolling it into the department uh, of transportation here in massachusetts um, i i'm not sure the best approach but i do know that we're at the end of governor baker's time as governor we'll have a new governor elected in november and i think the MBTA is going to have to be a priority. And I hope that the next governor, and I anticipate the next governor, will call together transportation experts and come up with uh, a, a well-thought plan for putting the MBTA uh, back on track. We, you know, excuse the pun, but it, um, it's had some tough times lately. I take the train regularly. I always feel safe. But nonetheless, these incidents are occurring, and they have to be addressed. This seems to have been delays in maintenance. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, oh, for many years, the MBTA did not receive the funding that it should have. Um, certainly in the last few years, we have committed great amounts of money to the MBTA with a focus on improving uh, the, the service overall, getting it to what they call state of good repair, meaning making sure the tracks and the stations and the vehicles are all in good repair and able to serve the public. And beyond that, we've invested in uh, capital programs as well, expanding the green line and uh, putting new cars, buying, purchasing new cars. But the purchasing of new cars has been delayed as it's well. It's been delayed for a couple reasons. One, just um, the manufacturer has not been able to deliver as promised. And then COVID did play a role in that as well in terms of the supply chain. So all that is in the works. But as much as we have committed money to the operational budget and to the capital budget, um, there's also a culture at the MBTA in terms of safety that I think has to be addressed. It was brought up in a, a report that was done, and uh, I think that's a, it has to be a priority. And uh, we should mention that um, Mayor Wu had, um, in a recent press conference, mentioned that, um, I don't know what the wording was exactly, but almost that it was this shutdown, this, this um, maintenance that needs to be done is going to cause pretty severe disruption in service. It will, and as of this point, they still haven't announced exactly what the plan is, even though the closing of the Orange Line is going to occur next week. And so I understand- For a month. Yeah, for a month, exactly. So I understand that the mayor is concerned. Um, we went through a situation where we had just one station closed in Quincy, if you remember, when Wallace station closed. And that was a big undertaking. And I, I supported the idea of closing the station while it was reconstructed. But that was a big undertaking. It went pretty well. So hopefully the MBTA will be able to establish bus, bus routes that work um, and that are safe. And uh, I think they will, but there's always that period of transition. But it certainly is going to be a major inconvenience. The upside of it is they're going to be able to get done in one month uh, work that would otherwise have taken them five years with periodic shutdowns or weekend closures. So it's a new approach. Uh, hopefully it's going to work. Hopefully it's going to work to provide better service and safer service. And in this month's time, there will be bus service. Yes, they've already contacted with a bus provider, the same uh, bus company that provided service when Wallace and Station was closed. And I have to tell you, um, and I, they may use multiple bus services, but at that point it was Yankee bus lines, and they were very good to deal with, and I thought they did a very good job. So I have confidence in their ability to, to meet the demands of the closure. 
but um, the focus really has to be on getting tracks fixed, updating stations, and then changing the culture of the MBTA. Um, when we had the general manager and the secretary of transportation before the transportation committee, I asked them about the culture. And it is changing. And one of the things I found interesting was the general manager of the T said that they have an anonymous safety tip hotline where employees, when they notice a safety issue, can anonymously report it to you know, higher ups. And my feeling is that that might be good as a transitionary approach, but MBTA employees should be encouraged to raise their hand when they see a safety issue. And rather than fear retribution, they should be acknowledged for doing it. If somebody says, hey, I saw that, I don't think that's safe, it raises their hand, it should be nice pickup, good work, let's get that fixed, rather than having to have that person go to an anonymous tip line. That culture is changing, but it's, that process has to be accelerated. Employees have to be uh, empowered to, to raise their hand, because uh, in my dealings with them, they will. They, they're out there, they're the ones doing the work, they know what has to be done. They raise their hand and sometimes they feel like there's retribution for raising their hand, so we've got to encourage them to, um, to be able to speak up and then the management and supervisors to step in and get the work done. Well, there are certainly with, with them to get the work done. Right, right, agreed. Uh, there certainly will be more on, on this topic, and yes. I'm sure it will be the topic of several other programs that you and I lot going on. will do together. Uh, let's switch, if we can, because, again, a lot uh, to discuss. Uh, the FY23 budget, uh, Norfolk and Plymouth District, uh, is seeing a 5% increase in government aid and an 11% increase in public school funding. Yeah, it, both are historic levels. Um, we do unrestricted general government aid, which is money that municipalities can use to supplement their local budget. And so that helps with police, fire, veteran services, seniors programs, li uh, library services, all those things benefit from our unrestricted general government aid that's provided. And that's at record levels this year. Um, and then also the biggest part of our local aid is Chapter 70 funding, which is used specifically for schools. And that's very helpful to communities um, to take kind of the pressure off the local taxpayer through the local tax bills. Um, and those are at record levels throughout the entire district and throughout the Commonwealth. We passed uh, education reform a couple uh, last session and there's substantial funding now dedicated to that to make sure that with the change in the formula we use to fund local school districts that we now have the money to back it up and we've been able to do that. It's a, an enormous step forward uh, for public education in Massachusetts. Keeping with of course your district uh, looking at um, the transportation bond bill and um, the dollar amount of at least a million dollars in funds uh, through the uh, Senate's transportation bond bill for local projects, and those are selected by each municipality. Yes, um, so the municipalities will then, uh, once they get this funding, and we always have to remind people with bond funding, so that it's uh, money that is available, available to be utilized uh, if the governor decides to use it. So we appropriate it make it available and then the governor can choose from a long list of projects um, that have been authorized through the legislation and prioritize them and decide which ones to advance with. So even though there may be bond money dedicated for a specific purpose, the governor ultimately chooses. But we were successful in getting in the bond bill money for each of the communities in the Norfolk and Plymouth District that um, if they want to appeal with the legislature to the governor to have uh, a certain street done or an intersection redone and that money is available through the bond, then hopefully the governor will respond to that and release the money and uh, we'll see those projects advance. Expanding protections for reproductive and gender affirming care. Yes, yeah, so um, that was prompted by the recent Supreme Court decision relative to Roe versus Wade. We had done the Roe Act in Massachusetts a couple of years ago, which was considered you know, uh, a pretty comprehensive piece of legislation relative to reproductive rights. And then things changed in the, on the Supreme Court, and as a result, the Roe decision was overturned. And so here in Massachusetts, we wanted to make sure of a couple things. One is that if somebody comes from another state uh, for an abortion here in Massachusetts, where it's legal, that the person providing those abortion services or in any way assisting in those services are protected from lawsuits from other states. For instance, in Texas, they have uh, come up with a system where private individuals can 
bring lawsuits against those that may assist in abortions. And we want to make sure that s s residents of Texas... That's scary. Yes, it that is. residents of Texas cannot sue somebody providing a legal service in Massachusetts. And it's not just relative to reproductive rights. It's, it's, it's a pretty ba dangerous precedent in, in across the board on types of things that it could impact. So, we, um, so anyway, we went back and we fine-tuned uh, language relative to the Roe Act, made sure that uh, individuals who are pr providing legal services in Massachusetts are protected from lawsuits from people in other states, and then clarifying uh, at what stages of a uh, pregnancy that abortion could be um, performed. And there's that 24-week mark that um, we clarified when after 24 weeks abortions could be performed. And then I um, worked on the Senate side with a colleague, Senator Rauch, to try and get uh, miscarriage services provided, uh, have uh, no deductible, no copay for miscarriage services. If we're going to you know, have that on the abortion, when abortions are um, necessary, that we should also have it when there are miscarriages. We were able to get that in the Senate bill, but did not survive the conference committee and it was not included in the final bill. But I think that's very important that we have that balance in our reproductive rights legislation. With the uh, Supreme Court, uh, the way it's structured now, uh, there's fear that this is only the beginning. There is a real concern about what may be next. We've um, had gay marriage legalized here in Massachusetts. We're the first state to do it. Uh, I don't remember how long it's been now, but it's been many, many years. And um, it's widely supported. And there's concern that the Supreme Court may uh, find a case and perhaps overturn that as well. So there's a lot of things going on, um, and also relative to, to gender. And that's why uh, the legislation we passed made sure that anybody um, providing gender uh, care guidance, um, uh, medical services, that they're protected from lawsuits as well from people out of state. Let's look at uh, early childhood care and the education bill. Yes, so um, we passed the bill in July um, in response to what we've been hearing from constituents uh, across the Commonwealth. It is so difficult to find child care placements and as a result um, people are choosing to uh, change careers even though they don't want to they're trying to find careers that match with being able to stay at home to provide child care at home because they just can't find placements and um, there are many child care providers who physically have enough space to take in more children but they're having difficulties finding teachers and staff to provide those services and so the, the bill was designed to encourage people to enter that workforce and to assist with rates and compensation so that um, those empty slots that, that are empty because there's not enough people staffing or teaching are filled and that we can bring people back into our early childhood education system. I heard and probably no surprise that COVID has uh, really had an impact in career choices. A lot of teachers or those maybe thinking of going into teaching have left, either left the profession or never fully went into the profession. Right, some, some have left because um, COVID was a very difficult time to be a teacher. It was a very difficult time to be a um, first responder, police fire, nurse, across the board. It was just a very difficult time. And I think what's happening is that young people are looking at professions differently. And many of them like the idea of having a hybrid op work opportunity. And so we're, we're having difficulty attracting people to law enforcement, to, to firefighters, to nursing, to teaching, to early childhood education. And those are all professions where you have to be there. And sometimes you have to be working a midnight to eight shift. And so I think young people looking at saying midnight to eight or you know, waking up at 8.30 for, to go online at nine o'clock three days a week and only having to commute two days a week, I think they're finding that appealing compared to some of the more traditional occupations. And we're gonna have to figure that out because obviously um, the, those types of professions, nursing, medicine, uh, police, fire, teachers, all of those is so critical. Um, and we're finding it in the construction trades as well. And I don't know how comfortable I feel with doctor's visits that are online, personally. Yeah, I, I, I've had uh, a few, unfortunately, uh, um, online, and they've worked out fine, but they were kind of post-surgery uh, visits, and uh, those worked, but um, so I've grown a little bit more comfortable personally with them, but there is no substitute really for going in and having the conversation, having the testing and, and all that lab work done, um, and that one-on-one -on -one with the physician. That's, that's really important. There's some cases where I think 
uh, online, uh, you know, virtual is okay, but um, things are just changing so really? quickly. It's really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's look at the economic development bill, and uh, I just have one a bit here regarding the commuter transit tax benefits. Yes, yeah, so we have tried on, on a few occasions to recognize that people who take public transportation sometimes don't get the same tax benefits as people who drive. Um, there's always a mileage deduction and things like that. And so we have tried on many occasions to do two things. One would be to make sure that the state matches a federal tax credit for commuters and that that is extended to cover people who commute by bike as well, that they would be able to um, uh, offset the cost of, of purchasing a bike, for instance, um, through the commuter tax credit. And then the second thing that we've tried to do is to have uh, employers of companies that are 50 or more provide a pre-tax benefit for people who use public transportation, that they can have the money taken out of their paycheck on a pre-tax basis and use that money to buy an MBTA pass, to buy a bicycle, um, to basically help them commute to, to work. We have found, for instance, that because of the hybrid schedule, fewer people ride in the MBTA, fewer people are buying monthly passes because they don't work uh, economically when you're commuting maybe only two days a week as compared to five. And so we think this approach would be, would be really helpful to commuters, get them off the roadways onto public transportation. It's better for the environment and it's just so much more efficient. And I can tell you, uh, being a commuter to Boston, it's, it's faster. Not always going in, but definitely coming out of the city, the MBTA is, red line is always faster. Uh, quite a lot in the economic uh, development bill to talk about. Next is the government employee health insurance coverage you're proposing from day one. Yes, and, and many in the private sector, when they start employment, their benefits kick in immediately. Um, in the Commonwealth, the uh, health insurance benefit may not uh, kick in for several days, weeks, um, sometimes a couple months. And so we find that it's uh, affecting our ability to draw people into public uh, sector into state government jobs. You know, they might have a family and to go without insurance for a couple of weeks is, is a big risk that some people are unwilling to take. Or if COBRA is available, um, the cost of that is, is prohibitive and so they may look for another job. Um, so that was in the economic development bill. You know, overall it was a $4.3 billion bill, so there's, there's so many things in there. Unfortunately, the economic development bill right now is in limbo. Um, we, uh, the state's revenues were so robust that it triggered a law that was passed in 1986 that requires taxpayer money to go back to the taxpayers. There's an estimate that that will be about $3 billion. And so there's a trying to figure out whether we can do that, which I believe we should, and do the economic development bill at the same time, which I believe we should. I think we have the ability to do both. And the economic development bill is so important to uh, the Commonwealth. It, it, provides so much to private industry, to the public sector. To, uh, it's really a, a bill that uh, truly invests in the future of the Commonwealth. So will, potentially, will residents of Massachusetts be receiving a potential check? So uh, the way the law is written, uh, my understanding of the law, which is Chapter 62F, is that they would receive a tax credit. Okay. Uh, so when they file their taxes next year, um, they would receive a tax credit. There's some discussion about changing the way the money may go back, whether we will give it back. My sense is that, um, and I'll see the final version of what's recommended, but my sense is that we should um, give the money back in the way that it came in um, proportionately to how it came in, and that would go as a tax credit. And then we had also talked about giving um, back to people in lieu of a gas tax cut, uh, $250 or $500, depending on, you know, individual or a couple, and depending on their income ranges. And so that's in limbo as well. But uh, I'm hopeful that over the next couple months, we will pass the economic development bill. I was in Abington yesterday talking to the town uh, manager down there, and he conveyed to me how important it is and how many good things are on that bill for cities and towns and how it essential it is that we, we pass that. Another uh, piece of that uh, legislation involves surgical assistance. Yes, yeah, so that's something that I've been involved with. Um, surgical assistants have found themselves in limbo because of some changes in how the licensing has occurred. And so we um, have proposed a licensing structure for surgical assistants. And it would be locally be very beneficial because Quincy College is in a position to, to, to um, step in and do that type of work. They have been and they would com 
be able to continue doing that. Um, so we're looking to get that licensing structure in place. The people uh, who are surgical assistants, they're all trained, they've done the work, and because of the change and regulation, they now find themselves in this, this limbo, uh, this gray area. So we want to clear that up as quickly as possible to take advantage of that. Those, those who provide the service. And certainly it's a valuable service and those that are choosing that as a career shouldn't suffer economically. Correct. Yeah, and so that's the whole idea is to, to get them back to work, those that have not been able to, uh, to clarify for those who are still working, you know, what the limits are on their license and what type of work they can do. Um, it's, it's, it's a real cost-saving profession as well. Um, surgical assistants play a very important role in our healthcare delivery system. Next, uh, let's uh, talk about, I know we've done this in previous shows, MS care. Yes, so um, I had filed legislation to ensure that somebody who has found the right medication for multiple sclerosis gets to stay on that medication. If they change jobs and that change of job results in a change of insurance, that they do not have to change their medication. Because we found that when they uh, change a medication, if they regress, uh, then they never get back what they've lost in terms of their physical ability. And so we worked really hard to advance that bill. It is now attached to a step therapy bill, uh, which kind of covers a lot of the same ideas. And so that uh, bill has passed in the House and Senate and the details are being worked out. There's just an issue now of about a 72 hour or th versus three day notice provi provision, three business days or 72 hours. We think it should be 72 hours and I, I think um, there's agreement on that bill, and I'm hopeful that that will pass in the next uh, several weeks as well. It's so important to people with diseases like uh, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, any sort of chronic disease that where they have come to find a medication that really works for them. And we, you know, when they change insurance or jobs, that should not result in having to start the process of finding that same medication all over again. Right. They're already uh, dealing with the uh something that's debilitating. Yes. So to worry on top of that doesn't make sense. If they find it's a medication that works, stay on it. And when they come off of it, not only in, in, MS, in uh, MS situations, do they regress, but they're also likely to end up hospitalized or going to the emergency department or things like that, which are very costly. So if, if the medication's working, keep them on the medication. It's better for them, most importantly, and it helps uh, contain costs in our healthcare delivery system. Let's talk about healthy homes. It's an effort to, to allow, for instance, um, for the abatement of lead paint. There's so much focus on affordable housing, market rate housing, building more, all of which we have to do. And we should mention that we live in an area of the country that does have dated yes. buildings. Yes, um, many of our homes uh, have lead paint in them. And so as we build more affordable housing and market rate housing and families move in, that's great because they'd be moving into lead-free living spaces. But there are so many people still living in homes that have lead paint. And every time a window goes up or down in one of those homes, there's a dust that's created. And every time a child's playing in the backyard uh, where there's been paint peeling off a house, they're at risk of ingesting lead, picking up a piece of it. And so the healthy homes would help address lead paint abatement and also address issues such as mold and mildew that uh, cause health problems. And it's the same thing, an ounce of prevention um, you know, is worth a pound of cure. Um, this is really a way to prevent young people from being exposed to lead paint and all people from being exposed to lead paint and mold and mildew and unhealthy living situations. Our last topic, or nearly last topic today, is uh, quite a big one. It, uh, not that the others haven't been, certainly they all have been, but uh, this has probably been in the news most recently, and that's sports betting. Yes, um, it has been in the news. Um, the House had passed a version of sports betting, and then the Senate had passed a version of sports betting. And they, there was differences between the two bills, and that usually prompts then a conference committee where um, there's three members of the Senate, three members of the House that come together to try to work out those differences. One of the big differences between the House version of the bill and the Senate version of the bill was whether to allow betting on uh, sp college sports events here in Massachusetts. The presidents of the colleges expressed concern about that. And so it took a little while, but ultimately the compromise was reached that you, uh, residents of Massachusetts will not be able to bet on Massachusetts college sports, except if a team is in the playoffs or in March Madness or, or something like that. 
And so that was the compromise. And to me, that makes good sense. I think 13 other states, 16 other states had come to the same kind of conclusion and reached the same compromise. And so that seemed to um, allow then the sports betting bill to move forward. So there will be sports betting opportunities at our casinos. There will be mobile sports betting opportunities uh, associated with the casinos and then independent. There'll be a, a tax assessment on those, lower if you're betting in a casino, higher if you're betting through mobile. One of the things that I really pushed and um, was able to get some of it in the Senate, but not in the final bill, was to, to address advertising or limit advertising to young people. Um, I'm really concerned about that, and we will revisit that issue. Um, it's, I just think that they are going to be targeted, in some cases directly and in other cases indirectly, because that's the future of the market. And uh, young people find this appealing. And so we try to put the brakes on um, the idea of just having no restrictions relative to advertising. And uh, we're going to keep working on that. In the uh, closing moments, I know that you have spent uh, recently countless hours at the State House, uh, but in doing so, you were actually able to take some photos of um, the State House when it was relatively quiet, maybe after a late night meeting. And we should, uh, well, if folks don't already know, and a lot do, what a beautiful building. It's a, it's a spectacular building, and they've done some work in the Senate chamber. They're going to do some work in the House chamber. It's, it's unique, and I visit a lot of state houses, um, and the Massachusetts State House to me is, is, is the best. I know I'm biased because <laughs> I happen to work there. But at night, um, you realize what a beautiful building it is. And so uh, oftentimes I'll take pictures. Uh, I walk. I like to say I walk, I snap. So I was walking through the building, and um, it was nobody was around. It was late at night. And I was take some pictures. I managed to get a picture of John Adams, which he does not have a big presence in the Massachusetts State House. Um, so there's a bust of him that I was able to get a picture of, a picture of the State House itself, the hollow flag, the grand staircase, um, and it's just a it's a beautiful building. And I'm very fortunate sometimes to be there um, and to, to walk through the halls and have it all to myself. And lastly, you mentioned John Adams, um, the author David McCullough passed away sadly recently. Yes. Uh, a great author. A great author and he, and he really was so, no, so well known to Quincy because of the Adams book and his presence here uh, as he was researching and then as the book was released. He was such a unique talent, uh, such a great historian, able to convey history in a way that people found so appealing and that was through written form. And then through um, his role in American Experience, his voice was, was every bit as, as great as his writing. Um, so I, uh, interestingly, I, um, I have a Truman book, and I met, in 1998, I met Dave McCullough, and he, we chatted a little bit, and he got talking about politics, and I said, well, you know, like Harry Truman, everybody has losses politically, and, and the mayor now, uh, May Koch, was standing next to me at the time, and we both had said, you know, we lost city council races. So he wrote into the book, um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but, you know, uh, hang in there or something like that, and, I, and so I'm going to pull out the book, but it was really a nice personal note that he wrote, like, you know, stick with it or whatever, and uh, so I'm going to pull it out and, um, and, and share that. Yeah, and reflect. It was, uh, he's such a, he was such an incredible person and what a, what a role he played uh, bringing American history to people. Absolutely. Yeah. Senator, I want to thank you for joining me today and uh, of course welcome you back in the future. I know you're pretty much here on a monthly basis and we certainly welcome that and I'm sure the residents of the Commonwealth do as well. Right. Great to be here and look forward to coming back. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And thank you at home for watching. Just please remember to support your local Access TV station for more programming just like this.